Welcome to League Legends on Fox Sports. Nothing quite glues a fan's heart to their club more than a local hero. And the great Balmain teams of the 1980s bristled with homegrown talent. The suburb was working class. It was a foundation club. And our guest today grew up and played his whole glorious career for the Balmain Tigers. In fact, it's difficult to imagine Wayne John Pearce OAM charging at the defence in anything but a black and gold jumper. Wayne, welcome to League Legends. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. You were literally a Tiger Cub in Tiger Town, growing up around the corner from Leichhardt Oval. Tell us about that childhood and how it made you black and gold. Well, from as young as I can remember, I used to go to Leichhardt Oval and sit on the hill and um, watch the the Tigers. When I got older, um, my dad got a... A, a job as a caretaker at Leichhardt Oval, so he worked for Leichhardt Council and we got we moved to the caretaker's cottage, which was straight opposite uh, the main gates of, of Leichhardt Oval. Um, I ended up sort of selling um, cordial drinks uh, around the hill at Leichhardt Oval. That was like when I was 14, I think it was, and then when I was a bit more mature and a bit older, I started selling hot dogs, so I used to sell hot dogs at the ground and just... Uh, for me, um, I just sort of loved that, that area and I was just a, a huge, huge Tigers tragic and, and, and back in those days they, they weren't that successful either. But um, apart from 69, I remember yeah. 69. But that um, lit a fire, didn't it? At a it very did, yeah, 69. Stage. Yeah, yeah. So what actually happened was uh, in 69 when the, when the Tigers won, um, we couldn't afford to go to the game but we watched it. Oh, this on the radio, I think it was. And... and uh, they won, so myself and my two younger brothers, we we signed up with um, – next year we went down and we signed up with the Balmain Police Boys Club and um, that was the start of my, my playing career um, as, a, as a Tiger. Prior to that, we were always just playing footy in the, in the paddock, but but that was that was, um, that was was my foray in, onto the field. To lose your father at 14 is such an enormous thing. How did that shape you? He was only 45, Ray, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he um, – he, he was 45. He, he actually dropped dead of a heart attack, and and that was it was pretty hard at the time. Um, but what 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 happened? My mo- mother did a, a great job raising us three kids, um, and you being the oldest boy too. I, I was the yeah. oldest boy, so I had to sort of step up as um, the, the man of the house, and that was sort of hard at the time. But uh, in hindsight, it, it probably shaped shaped me. Um, because yeah, I had to sort of, um, in a way, develop pretty um, basic sort of leadership skills, and um, and anyhow, that was that was what was dealt, and 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 get on with life. Yeah. So you became a captain then, in a way. Yeah, I, I did actually. I, I was sort of um, I was sort of captain at my club junior footy side. I played for Balmain Police Boys, uh, which was. Uh, a, a great experience back in those days. Birchgrove Oval was my home training ground and that was um, the, the, the first ever game of rugby league in Australia was sort of played down there. So it was, I didn't realise the significance of that at the time, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, the memories were great, but um, it, it, I was sort of had those sort of leadership skills from a young age, I suppose. When you came into grade, what was your attitude to conditioning and fitness? And how did that manifest itself in your behaviour? Um, I mean, I, when my father died, because he was so young um, and he had three brothers that all died before the age of 50 from cardiovascular disease, I saw sort of a, some sort of a link there. So I, um, I started to learn what I could about sort of health and fitness at a pretty young age. And there was not much around then. You couldn't, there was no internet, so you couldn't go on the internet yet. Had to go to libraries and learn what you could, but there wasn't really any books on on sort of um, health even back then. There was a couple of books on running and a few basic things on diet, and then. Uh, but I learnt what I could, and and I started training hard, and that was for me, I suppose the it was the the foundation upon which I sort of um, built my my rugby rugby league career. I wanted to be fitter than everybody else, and I was prepared to put the effort in and for me as I got older um, 
and I went to university, uh, I did a science degree and started to learn about the science of the body and, and, uh, and also the mind because I studied psychology. Um, I, I then started to appreciate that there was a lot of stuff that I could do that, I, that other people weren't doing that would, get, would give me an edge and I suppose uh, I developed this curious mindset and, and I started to apply myself to a whole lot of things that gave me sort of an edge. Early in your career, you took a finger to your eye and it was a serious injury. If you'd had to adjust to that problem with your left eye, the left side of your body, later in your career, do you think it would have been much harder? Uh, I think it probably would have, but it, but it, it, and I never really talked about it, but it, um, it created a problem right through my career. I'm still blurred in my left eye, so whenever... Uh, a ball came to me from that air, that side. Uh, I was always at a disadvantage, and I dropped quite a few balls come from this side because just the vision wasn't there. Uh, it was also difficult to try and judge depth on high balls. So you know, there'd be a couple of times where the ball would come to me from the kickoff, and I'd say your ball, and I'd point to uh, to Gary Jack or someone else to catch it because uh, I just wasn't sure whether I'd catch it or not. So, but I, I kept that pretty quiet and didn't um, didn't sort of talk too much about it when I was playing. Frank Stanton came to Balmain early in your career and it, it, a rebuild began. Give us an example of what Frank did to begin that massive change that had its effect right through the decade. Yeah, yeah, oh, it did. I mean, Frank came in and, um, you know, we, we, sort of, we struggled. Um, the first year I played first grade, um, Dennis Tuddy was the coach and, and he gave me an opportunity, which was fantastic, and uh, I, I was appreciative for the opportunity but he Frank Stanton came in the next year and and the first year was tough for him because he he cleaned out uh quite a few players from the club that he believed needed to go and he brought in a lot of young guys and uh we had a very ordinary first year but from that point on we started to move back up the ladder and he built a culture that was um you know at the time was second to none and um it, it was it was built around it was around effort, hard work, but it was also around playing for each other. And uh, the guys that came to the club, none of them wanted to leave and, and a lot of them, got up, including myself, got offers from other clubs for more money, but you stayed because you wanted to be a Tiger. The Kangaroo Tour of 1982, you know, you would have, I guess, a year out called yourself a bit of a long shot for that, wouldn't you? Well, what actually happened was uh, I had no idea that, in fact, I didn't even think I was going to be any chance of playing on that or being chosen for that tour. So I booked my trip to Hawaii and a season trip with the boys, saved all my pennies. Um, and then on grand final night at, at uh, the Leafs Club, um, because the lower grades were in the grand final, uh, we went up to the club and uh, my name was chosen out, chosen and read out and, uh, like, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was, it was just um, an amazing and surreal feeling. Let's have a look uh, at some action from that tour. Another 40-yard pass. Well, they're toying with us now. Wayne Pearce striding for the line. That's Pearce. He's quite a sprinter if he could get in the loose. Max Crilly. Oh, and a lovely ball. From, and just look at this drop forward, Craig Young goal. Beautifully dropped. And there's that man, Wayne Pearce. What a try. A combination of front row forward play. And that crowd might well look sad. It's a rout here for Great Britain. So the combination of Max Krilich as captain, Frank Stanton as coach, what is it that makes a team invincible, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. How do you know? I mean, it's, it's a combination of a whole lot of things. I mean, Max um, as captain, for me, people say, who's the best captain I've played under? Without doubt, Max. Um, he, he, and, and what he did for me as a young guy coming into the team, um, you know, I went over as a, someone that was a wild card, I suppose, and uh, ended up playing in all the test matches and, and one of the big uh, factors of that was Max's ability to um, get me to believe in myself, you know, and, and along with Frank Stanton, uh, Frank was, a, was an amazing influence on my career um, because he, he um, was at the, cl at the club at the Tigers from 81 to 86, which is when the club was really re rebuilt. And uh, on, he was coach of that tour and he was also someone who was a, a wonderful mentor for me. 
Uh, one of the setbacks of the tour was obviously rooming with Sturlow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, He's a slob, wasn't he? No, nah, yeah. well... Still, I still call him my roomie, but uh, we were we were the odd couple, and and uh, you know he liked to sort of uh, to sleep in, and I liked to get up early, and he'd have the late nights, and I'd I'd have sort of be tucked up reasonably early, and and um, you know he liked to sort of um, have the fatty foods, and I liked to sort of eat healthy, and and he was messy, like he, he had all this, he'd throw his gear everywhere, and I ended up having to put a, a white bit of masking tape down the centre of the room and say, listen, Sterlo, that's your side of the room. Keep all the, all your undies and everything over that side, where you? And this is my side of the room. So anyhow, he um, he didn't like me getting up early and he came home. Well, I came home one day and I used to warm, warm up with a skipping rope of the morning, get up early and all this sort of stuff. And I came home one day and um, my skipping rope was cut up in 100 pieces. And I don't know if it was Sterlo, but he played some role in that for sure. The seismic change in the power of state of origin, you know, the balance between Queensland and New South Wales, you were there as that happened. When you were appointed captain and then got injured at the end of 1984 and Steve Mortimer had to take over, what did you think lay in the future then? Oh, man, I, I, I um, was fully supportive of, of, of uh, Steve as skipper. You know, he, he uh, was, a, was a great skipper. In fact, 85, I thought he did an outstanding job and was a... A, a huge factor in, in us uh, winning the series in '85. So for me, to to just be in the side was was all I was was looking for. Um, and for from the point of view of being part of that series, won the won the trophy for the first time for New South Wales was just the most amazing experience. When you were captain in 1986 and you won all three Origin matches from behind. Let's have a look at some of the action. The enormous banner erected to greet the New South Wales side and the fans love it. Wayne Pearce, captain of the side of in Lang Park, of course, retains his job tonight and he's done a great job of geeing his teammates up. As the Blues throw it around very nicely, Pearce got it away to Hedrington. Plenty of runners too as Roach got it. An overhead pass for Mortimer. Looking at Mortimer as Pearce for the ball. He's there. Well, there was any number of players involved in that. New South Wales handling superb, passing great. And Wayne Pearce is in in the corner. Wayne Pearce has been chaired off. A magic moment for New South Wales. Cheered off the skipper of the side. Had a great game too. Cheered off and uh, that was pretty appropriate. What a night. What, what a team. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing experience um, because it was only the year before that we won the series for the first time and then that particular series of three games, the biggest winning margin was, I think, six points, so a converted try. But we managed to get home in each game and um, the, the, just the, the, um, the bond that we developed amongst the players, I still see all those guys from time to time at different functions and uh, you feel like brothers. And, and it was, it was an, uh, just a, um, a unique experience and, you know, the, the coach... Um, Ron Willey did a fantastic job as he was a guy that wasn't really um, about the tactics. It was just about getting you in that frame of mind. You wanted to go out there and rip and tear. You hurt your knee in 1986 and you began that amazing race against the clock to be fit for the kangaroo tour. And I guess you, you partnered yourself with the surgeon who told you it, it was possible. And there ended up being a fitness test that was really a bit of a circus at Redfern Oval. I was there and it seemed awfully unfair. Yeah, I mean, probably the, 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 the moment of my career that I was most disappointed with the game um, and probably the only real point that I was most disappointed with the game other than when the Super League War came, which was after my time, but um, was, was, was that particular fitness test and um, how it was... It was basically designed to rule me out. Mm. The surgeon who operated on me, um, Merv Cross, um, and actually he said to me after the operation, he said, this is really unusual the way you've, you've done your knee. He said, 
um, wins the team picked. And I said, why is that? He goes, well, I think there might be a chance you can be back for the tour. I said, you're, you're kidding me. And he said, no. He said, the way it's, it's, it's been done and, the, and I'll fix it up, he said, it's going to be, it's going to be fine in, in probably 10 weeks. When's the tour leaving? I said, oh, it's leaving in, in 12 weeks. The most uh, acclaimed knee specialist in the country had cleared me to, to play. In fact, I've been training with the Train On squad for like uh, a week and a half, 10 days before the, 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 the fitness test and they were tackling me, twisting me, wrestling me. Anyhow, um, they were, was, look, the, the doctor was looking for some sort of excuse and um, I they, was... They made you sprint, didn't they? And in the after all this, like, mm. half an hour yeah. of wrestling, tackling, getting up, running backwards and forwards, uh, I had to do a sprint over Redfern Oval, Redfern Oval, at the end of the season, and it was pretty dry at that time. It was, like, corrugated uh, in the middle. And what happened was the knee that wasn't injured, um, the other knee hit a little bit of a divot mm. and I sort of stumbled a bit and kept running. And the doctor called me over and said, I saw you stumble there, your knee's no good. I said, it's the other knee. He said, no, you're no good, you're out. So that was, uh, that was it. But anyhow, you just had to uh, suck it up and get on with it and, and um, the rest is history. Given the path of the Tigers through the 80s, look, the rising talent, the rep players, the coaches you had, Biscuit Stanton through to Waza Ryan, 1989 was the year that it really was destined to be, wasn't it? They thoroughly deserved to win. You didn't get a premiership, but you got a farewell, a home farewell, that very few players get to have. Yeah, it was... Um, it was it, a hell of a day. It, it was, actually. It was... It was uh, quite an emotional day because that was my last game at Leichhardt Oval. So it wasn't my last game, but it was my last game at Leichhardt Oval. And it was against Parramatta and Sturlo once again, featured in, in my nightmares, right? Um, but he was, he was captain for Parramatta. And um, at the end of the game, I mean, I, I knew there was... That, that they had a presentation for me uh, and they wanted me to do a lap around the Oval, but I didn't know that they'd given out all these streamers and that they were going to play this really emotional music and all this sort of stuff, you know. And, um, and, and I'm jogging around the Oval um, because it was... Um, in the, I, I didn't know I was supposed to walk around the Oval, right, because apparently they had, they had like three or four songs to play and I got around there in one song, uh, which wasn't, wasn't uh, appreciated by Brian Walsh, who, who was my manager at the time, who organised the farewell, because he said, mate, he said, mate, you could, we've got three songs to play. But what happened was when I was jogging around, um, I was seeing, you know, all these supporters, you know, big guys, you know, they were truckies or wharfies, whatever, they had tears coming down their cheeks. And for me to see that, it was, it was very emotional. And um, the, the, because the club, uh, it meant so much to me. I'm thinking I'm not going to be able to, to sort of run out on this ground ever again. Given your subsequent success as an origin coach and the record you have as a coach and player. Can you look back now and laugh about the bonding session that you organised with the horses? Yeah. That went so terribly wrong. Um, I suppose that, that was one of, the, one of the things when I talked about me being curious, it was one of the things that <laughs> um, sort of backfired, yeah. So it started off with we were the first, I was the first coach to take the, t the players out of Sydney because I wanted to get them out of the pubs. As the bonding session, I didn't believe with the pub crawls was, was the way to go because I could see trouble down the track. So I thought, we'll go up away from Sydney. So we went up the Blue Mountains. We checked into a nice little eco resort up there and and uh, we had this this um, horse riding trek organised as a little activity. And anyhow, we started walking back and, and um, then there was uh, Terry Hill at the back who wasn't used to sort of following too many rules, didn't feel like we are going to walk all the way back. He's turned around to, I think it was Brad Fittler, and said, Freddie, what do you reckon? You know, and uh, Freddie said, um, yeah, OK. So I think it was him and, and Freddie who started galloping up this big hill. And it looked like Man from Snowy River stuff was beautiful, you know, and we, we had the, 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 the sort of the, the gear on, the riding gear on. Anyhow, and uh, we get up the top of the, the hill and turn around and it looked mag magnificent until I turned around and saw... Two horses come up with no one on them, and they were, looked down down the bottom, and there were two guys on the ground, which was Robbie Kearns and Bradley Clyde, which 
unfortunately, those those two guys they they got injured and didn't play in the the the, uh, the rest of the series. So it, it was a difficult night that night. But having said that, it worked in a, in a weird kind of way. It bonded the guys together even more. The horses were from Queensland, clearly. <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know where they were from, but um, they, they didn't obey the rules, that's for sure. <laughs> if you reflect that your dad, Ray, wasn't able to watch your rise through the game and all your achievements, but you've been able to watch Mitchell's, what's that been like? I mean, the, the amazing, for me it was, um, I mean, it's been, been great watching him right through um, his career and uh, to see the effort that he's put in, um, the flack that he cops, but he just bounces back. I mean... If there's, um, if you had a, a, a photo of somebody had you put next to the word resilience in the in the, the dictionary, I'd stick his photo in there because, you know, he, he's um, he's copped his fair fair share of flack and some of it warranted, some of it unwarranted, uh, but he keeps bouncing back and to me that that is something that that um, I take my hat off to him for. Again, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? And you know, as a as a person who chose a certain path, you know, through life, what do you say about it? I mean, but we've all got crosses to bear. I mean, I'm, I'm not squeaky clean. I've done stupid stuff as well. It's, um, um, that that um, social media was around years ago, like anyone in my era, um, we all would have been, been um, castigated, I suppose, for different bits and pieces. But in, in terms of the, the incidents with Mitchell, I mean... Uh, my advice to, to not just him but any of the players nowadays is is that you know you you're um, you're getting paid big money um, and what if you if you don't want to accept the responsibility of um, being that role model that um, the kids are going to look up to then uh, are you prepared to take a pay pay cut if not then you've got to really you've got to really step into a space that um, means that you. You've got to uh, adhere to what is expected of you. Mm. He's having a very good origin career, uh, almost parallel to yours uh, at the moment. It's pretty incredible. I think you're probably a match or two apart in origin terms. Yeah, he's achieved it at um, a lot quicker rate than I achieved it. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, he's a very skillful, talented player. He's a player that, that after the the uh, incident from, from uh, last year, the Australia Day last year, he's come a long way in terms of where he's at as a footballer um, and where his head's at. And I think that's a credit to, to him, his application, and to the people that have supported him both on the field and off the field. Who's the best player that you've seen in your time, Junior? For me, there's two types of... One, one's the most talented, I, I would definitely say Wally Lewis. Uh, but in terms of the best that was able to play consistently well at that high standard week in, week out, uh, I'd have to say my old Rumi, uh, which is one of your colleagues, Peter Sterling. You know, he was, he was amazing in, in his ability to, to just uh, play at that level week in, week out, regardless of the quality of the opposition, regardless whether it was a club game, whether it was a test match. Um, and for me, you know, those guys were amazing. In terms of, I suppose, post my playing career, probably the best I've ever seen... Um, was Andrew, is Andrew Johns. Um, and I, you know, Jonathan Thurston, probably Cameron Smith are both closing in pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's a whole lot of great players around. It's hard to compare players from different eras because of the preparation's different uh, and the game's different. Wayne, it's been a real thrill to talk about your life and your career, both on the field and afterwards. Thanks for being on League Legends. Thanks, Tim. This has been a Fox League production, part of the Fox Sports Network.